if you're well housed and you've got a reasonable job and you're kind of doing okay, is anyone actually comfortable stepping over a homeless person sleeping in the street on the doorstep outside your home? Are you comfortable seeing people who should be given care and support through a mental health service that often lets them down begging on our streets when they should be supported? Are we comfortable when we know there is sufficient to go round, but there isn't sufficient to assuage the greed of the very rich? Are they comfortable with that in our society? You and I know the answer to that. The greatest single achievement of this movement, I believe, was the creation in 1948 of the National Health Service. Yeah. Healthcare free as a human right at the point of use for everybody. There's something humbling about going into a maternity unit in a hospital, seeing a newborn baby, and the first thing that newborn baby is given is their NHS number. Free healthcare for the rest of their lives. Doesn't happen in the USA. Sadly, doesn't happen in Mexico. It doesn't happen in many parts of the world. Because we as a movement have elevated the principle of care for all to the unitary principle that everybody should care for everybody else. Solidarity in action. It's on every banner, every poster, and the heart of every member of every union that is here today. We built the National Health Service. We brought in comprehensive education on the basis that we don't want our children divided up like sheep and goats at 11. We want our children growing up, educated together, understanding each other, understanding different contributions we can all make to a community. And it was a Labour government led by Harold Wilson and the legislation brought in by Jenny Lee that established the Arts Council and the Open University because that government believed, I believe, we believe, that education for all is a right, not a privilege. So we stand for that society that will do things in a very different way. Too many people and too many communities are being left behind in modern Tory Britain. Too many areas where skilled jobs existed, industries have, have died and good jobs have not been replaced. There's a lot of debate about what's happening in the Labour Party at the present time and uh, I'm inundated with questions, questions, questions all the time and I have patience that is infinite to answer questions, questions and questions. But one I got today really did puzzle me. They said, um, how are you coping with the pressure that's on you? I simply said this, there is no pressure on me, none whatsoever. Real pressure, real pressure, real pressure is when you don't have enough money to feed your kids, when you don't have a roof over your head, when you're wondering if you're going to be cared for, when you're wondering how you can survive. You're wondering how you're going to cope with the debts you've incurred. You're wondering if your lovely employer is going to give you a call to give you a couple of hours work or not bother or change their mind when you're on the bus on the way to do that job. That is the real pressure in our society. For those people struggling on low pay, struggling 
on zero hours contracts, not knowing what's coming from one week to the other, not knowing if they'll be able to pay the rent, not knowing if they're going to be homeless, not knowing if their children will end up in care. That's the kind of brutal pressure that's put on people every day of the week in this country. The Thatcher government destroyed the coal industry and what's it been replaced by there? Mike Ashley, Sports Direct, people not even getting the minimum wage, hundreds on zero hours contracts and grotesque levels of danger and exploitation in a place that ought to be decent, harmonised, well-paid, unionised jobs. So if anybody says that unions don't matter, think of the parallel of the great struggle to found the National Union of Mine Workers to bring together the area associations and the way it brought about national pay bargaining and national conditions. I say to anyone who thinks a union is not for them, one day you might have an accident. Sadly, it might happen to you. One day, an employer might be unreasonable towards you. You're then going to need a union. Don't wait for that day. Join now. <laughs> Dennis pointed out that after the Second World War, this country was basically bankrupt. The national treasure had been rinsed out to pay for the war. But the post-war Labour government had a different way of doing things. It said, we have to build a society where everyone matters. Therefore, an economic policy of full employment, of public ownership, of major industries, an economic policy that enabled a national health service to come around and be here for all time, council housing to be built to give people secure homes to eliminate the worst aspects of poverty within our society. Somewhere over the past 20 years, 30 years maybe, we've kind of lost our way a bit. Neocon agenda has come along, which says that all that matters is creating further levels of inequality in order that the very rich up here might be a bit of a trickle down and the very poor down here might get a job doing something to help them out. We're told that austerity is necessary and we've all got to be punished because of the excesses of the bankers in 2008-2009. Well, I want to say thank you to John McDonnell and his team for saying what it's true. Austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. And that we don't have to accept the rolling back of the state. We don't have to accept the rolling back of everything that we believe in. And we need a government that recognises the inequalities that exist within our society. Not just the big economic, economic inequalities I've talked about, but the regional ones as well. There's been some horrible, horrible incidents over the past couple of weeks in this country. Hate crime, racist attacks, attacks on synagogues, mosques, and many, many other places. An attack on a synagogue, an attack on a mosque, an attack on a church, an attack on a school, an attack on a minority is, in reality, an attack on every one of us and the kind of society in which we wish to live. Prejudice doesn't build a school, doesn't build a hospital, doesn't create a job. Prejudice and that degree of racism only encourages more prejudice, more hatred and more racism. Our movement was founded, our movement exists to bring people together in order that they could achieve justice for all, not just the few. So, we invest in people's skills and you best invest in people's skills not by cutting college education or increasing university fees instead by recognizing that everybody has skills 
that need to be developed. And when somebody is trained as a good doctor, a good engineer, we all benefit because we all get better services as a result of that. So we need a government that invests through public investment in new technologies and new industries and has its basis on sharing wealth. We cannot be a civilized society until we eradicate the scourge of the depression of high unemployment, of underemployment, the scourge of children living in poverty, of pensioners having to choose between heating and eating in winter, of people not knowing what their hours of work will be from one week to the next. Democracy is something we fight for, something all our forebearers fought for, to gain the right to vote. There's a complete line of connection between the Great Reform Act of 1832, the Factories Act of 1840, the Education Act of 1870, the National Insurance Act of 1908, the National Health Service Act of 1948, the Equalities Act of 2010. These things happen because people are empowered through democracy. Our movement is fundamentally based on democracy and the right of our members to make a choice of the direction in which our unions, our movement and our party wants to go. So, we recognise our solidarity in struggle. We recognise the need to defend our human rights and the human rights of others all around the planet. So we don't walk away from international obligations on human rights. We strengthen them because strong human rights helps to prevent war and helps to prevent the disfigurement of so many people's lives. And we work for the concept of a society, a community, where everyone matters. Every child deserves security, health, education, and the ability to expand their imagination. Ours is not just an economic endeavour and an economic set of principles. It's about the way we live and about the genius that's in all of us. In art, in music, in poetry, in culture, in thought, in theatre, in song, in dance. Look at the miners' banners today, the art that was on them and is on them. Look at the music we heard today and the genius that's within that. And so our society is also about ensuring real cultural freedom for everybody to gain that expression. That's what brings us together and helps us to create a better and stronger society. Davy finished on a very important point. I was brought up to believe that our job was to do our best in our life. Our job was to try and make the world a better place during our life, that our children's generation would have a better standard of living and more opportunities than we had. And they, in turn, would do the same for their children. The onward march of using and harnessing science and technology for the good of all, not the enrichment of the few. And so why are so many of our young people being told, sorry, sorry, but there might not be a health service there for you. There might not be sufficient pensions there for you. You might be deeply in debt because you tried to get an education. And there is uh, Jeremy the Corman uh, winds up his speech uh, in Durham, in Britain, to the Durham Europe, Miners' Gale.